from Scott and the system. And today we will be talking to Mr. William Berman from uh, Berman and Rydell Law Firm in San Diego. He specializes in elderly abuse. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Uh, to get started, how did you start your firm? Was it like a personal experience or? So I became involved in practicing in the area of elder abuse litigation very, very early on in my career. Um, I was contacted by a client of mine whose mother had an incident at a uh, residential care facility for the elderly. Um, and in investigating the case, uh, it became apparent that she was the subject of significant abuse and neglect. And I took on the case as a young lawyer. Um, I was able to work it up uh, and prove some of the uh, most horrific of circumstances uh, care or lack of care, abuse and neglect that led to uh, the death of my client's mother. Uh, and in handling this case, uh, I had to learn the body of law that exists in California uh, with respect to California's statutes that govern specific claims regarding to abuse and neglect. And uh, we were able to resolve that case successfully uh, with one of the largest reported results ever in the state of California. And it spurned my practice in this very niche area of the law. And I became um, very familiar uh, with the statutory scheme that governs elder abuse and neglect litigation. Um, and I became uh, well-renowned in California for handling these cases. I've handled these cases for the past 24 years. Um, I've handled um, probably in the range of uh, four to 600 uh, elder abuse cases. Um, and so we're considered one of the uh, preeminent firms in California for dealing with this particular type of litigation. Uh, that, wow, that's quite a good story. <laughs> wow. Um, to get started, when uh, families of, you know, someone with elder that is elderly, uh, how, how would they go about choosing the proper facility for their loved ones? Well, it's very important that somebody that's looking to place a loved one into a skilled nursing facility or a residential care facility um, or assisted living, uh, that they interview the facility, um, interview the staff, uh, make sure that they're comfortable in understanding the level of care that uh, is to be provided for their loved one. Um, Individuals can also go online and do research uh, in California to look at the rankings uh, or ratings more accurately of our skilled nursing facilities. Uh, you can go online and look up whether facilities, uh, be it skilled nursing facilities or residential care facilities, uh, have top ratings from the California Department of Public Health or from the Department of Social Services. And you can look up histories of complaints that are lodged against these facilities uh, to determine whether or not these facilities have complaints or uh, confirmed substantiated uh, incidents of prior abuse and neglect, uh, lack of care, um, or overall mismanagement of the facility. I guess what gets me is being in these type of 
environments, there's such a high turnover rate of staffing. Yeah, how, yeah, I just wonder how much that can be good or bad when you try to research, try to find the proper facility. Yeah, you raise a good point. I mean, turnover in this industry um, is very high. Um, it unfortunately results in a lack of continuity of care um, with different staff, uh, be it nurses or uh, CNAs, uh, care providers coming into the facility and leaving the facility. Um, it causes a serious disruption in the consistency of the care provided to patients and residents. Um, and so that's a great question to ask when you're interviewing a facility. Um, you can question them about their turnover rate, um, what their employee, employee history is, uh, what their retention rates are of, of employees. Um, those are all great questions to ask. I mean, would people be able to find out numbers wise what the ratio is based on my knowledge it's typically you know 15 to 20 patients per you know provider or care care attendant well in california there are minimum requirements for how much nursing care uh, has to be devoted to each patient okay. um and those are our standards set by um, our California laws um, and enforced by the Department of Public Health. Um, but what you are correct about is that um, certified nurse assistants, uh, non-nursing staff, generally have a high ratio. Um, we typically find that CNAs are assigned uh, upwards of 15 uh, patients at a time. Again, I want to distinguish between uh, actual licensed nursing staff and certified nursing assistants. Uh, there are no um, requirements. There's there's no standard uh, requirements for how many residents or patients a certified nurse assistant can handle. Uh, but there are strict guidelines with regards to uh, ratio of patient and per uh, uh, patient nursing care requirements. And that's where the gaps in the system tend to occur, I would assume. Uh, yes, uh, we do often see uh, that facilities are failing to provide uh, proper uh, nursing care based upon their uh, ratio of patients um, and the allocation of patients versus time that they have uh, in a day, in a week, in a month um, to provide patient care. Okay. Um, how would you classify elderly abuse compared to neglect? Well, abuse it per se um, has a intent element to it, okay. uh, where somebody in, intends uh, to harm or does something recklessly uh, that causes harm and injury. Uh, whereas neglect is the failure to provide adequate care, uh, a required care and meet the standard of care, um, which can similarly result in very, very serious injury um, and death. Okay. Would it be a fair assumption to say abuse occurs more in a facility type study where neglect perhaps would be more in a home type study? No, I would not agree with that. Okay. Um, okay. The, the uh, vast majority of uh, cases that we litigate under the Elder Abuse Act here in California 
uh, are based on neglect, are based on the lack of provision of care. Um, we see cases involving uh, decubitus ulcers, uh, skin breakdown, um, infection, malnourishment, um, dehydration, uh, and other uh, medical ailments that come from a lack of provision of proper care uh, versus an intentional act. So uh, I would say that uh, the high majority of cases are based on uh, actual neglect versus uh, an intentional abuse. Okay. Okay. That, that makes it more clear for me to understand. And when these situations occur, when is it best for a family member otherwise to consider seeking legal consultation? And, you know, before that, is there a, what would you say prior to that? What, what should they do to, you know, before they feel they got to do it or go ahead? Well, I think anytime there's a, a high suspicion of uh, abuse or neglect, um, that it's important that the loved one uh, who's overseeing the care uh, speak up. Uh, they can address it with the facility. Um, if they do not get uh, adequate response or if they do not find a significant change in the level of care that their loved one is receiving, um, then in California, uh, for skilled nursing facilities, they can report the suspected abuse or neglect to the California Department of Public Health. In the context of a residential care facility setting, uh, the California Department of Social Services uh, monitors the oversight of care provided to those facilities. But where there is a distinct incident or distinct injury uh, to a loved one, um, it is advised uh, to contact legal counsel. Uh, legal counsel can help in many ways, um, the least of which is, is proceeding with civil litigation um, to, to file claims for uh, the abuse and neglect. But oftentimes attorneys um, can help intervene um, to ensure that the residents' rights are being met and the residents receiving uh, the proper care that they need. So I, I always say to people, um, if you suspect abuse or neglect, uh, it's important to file the right complaints to have those suspicions investigated. Uh, and it's always wise to contact an attorney uh, to make sure that uh, you're getting the proper legal counsel. Okay. And with this type of situation be different in a home setting? Right, it becomes a, a, it actually becomes more difficult in the home setting. Um, you know, oftentimes you can call adult protective services or you can even call local law enforcement um, and have them investigate if there are serious suspicions of physical abuse or neglect. Um, but oftentimes, um, and it happens frequently, uh, where there's abuse or neglect in the home setting, um, it goes unreported uh, because the individuals that are committing the abuse or neglect are the ones uh, that usually monitor the oversight of the elderly individual. Um, and so the complaints uh, are difficult to to get out to the proper authorities. Okay. Yeah, yeah, being in a home setting, you have different, you know, protections in place. So, you know, they need to know how to, you know, access the proper 
your services is post a nursing home setting. Correct. Okay. Okay. And when someone is choosing a lawyer, what kind of questions should they be asking them to make a proper selection? Sure. So it's very important to find out the level of experience of the attorney that they're consulting with. Uh, a lot of attorneys will take on cases uh, because they sound good, um, yet they don't have familiarity with the laws and statutes that govern um, civil litigation involving elder abuse and neglect. Uh, so you really want to find out what the experience level is of the attorney make sure they've litigated uh, these particular type claims. Uh, you can ask an attorney their experience, uh, what their results have been, how many cases they have litigated in this niche field of practice, um, what percentage of their practice is devoted to litigating claims of elder abuse or neglect. Um, those are all important questions to, to ask an attorney. Um, and it's also important to ask attorney uh, how they would plan on pursuing uh, claims based on the certain facts and circumstances that exist in any particular case. So if a firm had, you know, had about a dozen different niches, you know, that they do in their office, you're probably not going to get very strong firm as opposed to somebody like yours that really specializes and has done a lot of, you know, cases in that field. Correct. Correct. So uh, our practice, for example, uh, we practice catastrophic personal injury of any type, um, but 70% of our practice uh, is devoted to uh, elder abuse litigation. Okay. And so um, as a firm, um, it's really what our focus is uh, and what our reputation has been built on. And that is being uh, specifically dedicated to practicing in this particular area of the law. Okay. And my last question here is, I, I wish I'd put out earlier, but how much would you say the last year plus the COVID pandemic situation has played a role in some of your cases? Right. So very good question. Um, and we're just starting to see uh, what that pandemic has caused with regards to the level of care in these facilities, because for quite a long time, uh, these facilities were under lockdown orders and family members were unable to get in to visit their loved ones. So a lot of the abuse or neglect that was going on in the facility was unwitnessed, uh, unnoticed, um, and unreported, um, including by the California Department of Public Health or the California Department of Public uh, Social Services, excuse me. Um, and so we're starting to see a lot of claims where once the shutdown mandates were lifted, family members were finally getting back into the facility uh, and finding loved ones who had suffered um, deplorable care, um, resulting in significant skin breakdown, again, pressure ulcers, decubitus ulcers, malnutrition, dehydration, uh, septic causing conditions. Um, and so it has played uh, a big role uh, in the lack of care uh, that was specifically being provided during this time. There was a lot of turnover with staff. Um, there were a lot of facilities that were running short staff. Uh, there were a lot of care providers that were uh, staying away from, from their, their job assignments uh, based upon the high levels of susceptibility to contacting COVID uh, due to the elderly uh, population. So uh, these facilities uh, with less staff, uh, there were obviously, uh, unfortunately, uh, more incidents of, of neglect during this period of time. 
again, a lot of it is is just coming to light. Is there anything family members could do in the future if these facilities or loved ones are in should go out lockdown again? Yeah, so the most important thing is to have family members involved. Um, unfortunately, we have a large segment of our society who places loved ones in care facilities, skilled nursing facilities, um, and then have very little monitoring of their loved ones. Um, we suggest that frequent calls to the facility be made to check on a loved one's condition. Um, phone calls be made to be uh, connected to their loved one, uh, even by way of telephone, to the extent that their loved one can can speak um, and, and constantly monitor and, and call upon the facility uh, to make sure that the facility is providing uh, the requisite care that the individuals need. Well, yeah, I I hope that's. Uh something that'll help protect them a little bit. We hope so. We hope so. Um, constant contact with the facility, being engaged in in care plan meetings um, and making sure that the, the facility is being held accountable uh, to provide the level of care that the loved one needs um, is very important to, to prevent from uh, prevent acts of abuse and neglect from occurring. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time.